So uh, good morning, and um, thank you, Ali, for, for that introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Warren Klug for organizing this and personally welcoming us to Aspen last night. Uh, you guys are in a wonderful town, and the only thing I'm a little upset about is that I haven't been invited earlier. Um, I also want to just thank all the other organizers, especially uh, Brett Hunt. Um, for those of you who have organized an event like this, it's hard. Uh, people cancel on you in the last minute, getting all the logistics right. So just uh, like to give Brett kind of a, a hand for, for, for doing all this. <laughs> and of course, I'd like to thank the National Immigration Forum, the Aspen Institute, and the Aspen Chamber Resort Association. So coming out here outside of Washington is re really refreshing for a couple of reasons. One is that I just want to say thank you to those of you who are here today. Um, you've taken time out of your busy lives away from, from working or away from your families to be here today. And this is really democracy in action. This is how change happens. Change happens at the grassroots level. You contact your elected officials, and then that's how change happens in Washington, D.C. So you being here today really helps things move along. And I know on this issue, we have faced a very, very long road. And it made me think about Winston Churchill's quote. I want to make sure I get the words right. Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all these other forms that have been tried from time to time. And so um, the president strongly feels that the time is right for comprehensive immigration reform. We think the stars are aligned, and we need your help to make that happen. It's your voices that help propel this forward. So again, I just want to say thank you for coming here today, taking time out of your busy lives to, to be here and to, to be real advocates on, on, on this issue. Um, so I'm here for really two reasons. First, I'm going to talk to you about kind of the, the economics, kind of the numbers, the business case for comprehensive immigration reform. I think that's kind of what I bring to the table for this conversation. And you have lots of excellent speakers after myself. Second, I'm here to listen. So I go outside the DC quite a bit. I usually talk to business leaders in specific groups. And I always enjoy hearing your stories about what's working, what's not working. And so far on this trip, I've heard several touching stories about immigration reform. When I was flying from Washington, DC to Denver, I had the, the pleasure of sitting next to this young woman who teaches high school science to 11th and 12th graders in North Denver. And so I was looking at her. She was grading kind of her physics homework uh, lessons. And I asked her what, you know, what, what, what she did. And then she was telling me about her school. And uh, she said 90% of her kids were, were Hispanic. And a lot of them were probably undocumented. And she was just so fearful for their futures. And you know, Warren told us one story, and that story repeats itself. And we always have to keep that in mind. So when you hear me talking today, I'm going to say a lot of numbers and show you a lot of charts. But behind this is a very strong human element. And I think you're going to hear that again and again. And we all have these stories as well. So with that, there we go. OK. So um, in my talk for the next 20 minutes or so, I wanted to talk about really just kind of two things. Um, the first is I want to give a brief overview of immigration over the past half century in the United States. OK, so, so why do I want to do this? Well, history tends to repeat itself. Um, and if we look at immigration into the United States the past 50 years, we see some really, really big changes. Um, and there's a lot of lessons learned, and especially lessons learned about how our current system is broken and how it really is in a 21st century system. And so if we look at the immigration in the past 50 years, what we see is that the foreign-born population in the United States quadrupled in size. It was one of the largest increases that we've seen in our history, um, if you go back into the 1800s as well. And also what happened, which is quite different from a historical perspective, is that the composition of the foreign-born in the country changed radically. Um, instead of being predominantly a European population that was in the Northeast and the Midwest, it really did transform to a Latin American Asian population located more in the South and in the West. Um, the second part of my talk then is to really just talk about the economics. So I'm gonna go through a bunch of reasons why it just makes good economic sense for comprehensive immigration reform. So I'll go through about you know, kind of eight different areas of stuff that you've heard about. And I'm gonna try to put some numbers on it, but I don't wanna to get too much into the numbers. I wanna be able to tell you a story. Okay, 
because when you hear the story, you'll say, well, yes, that makes a lot of sense. I can relate to that. Maybe it relates to my own business. You know, I know people who, who do this. And there's a tremendous amount of research out there, and I'm going to try just to distill it down to, to its important parts. Now, so let's start and let's look at some numbers about what's happened to immigration. And I just want to spend a couple minutes on this. So if we go back to 1960, we had about 9.7 million foreign born in the United States. Okay, that was about 5% of our population. That was a relatively low number. So between 1960 and 1970, the foreign born population, we didn't have much net, net migration to the United States. It was basically flat. Then something kind of remarkable happened. Between 1970 and 1990, the foreign born population doubled. Okay, then if we go from 1990 to 2010, it doubled again. So over that 40 year period, we had a quadrupling of the population of foreign born in the United States. It's one of the larger increases that we ever experienced. Um, now, oops. So what happened is the share of our population that's foreign born is about 13%, okay? Now if you look at the big immigration waves that we had in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, the foreign born population actually crested about 15%. So we had this very large increase. Um, historically, that was a pretty large increase, but we're still kind of below where we were, where we were at the peaks. Um, the other part I want to look at then is what's happened to where the folks were coming from. And you pretty much know this, but I'd like to just stick, stick, stick some numbers on it. Um, if you go back to 1960, about three quarters of our immigrants were, had European roots. Uh, only a small percentage were from Latin America or Asia. But then by, when you go to 2010, it's completely reversed. Okay? Europe is very small, North America is very small, and it's Latin America and Asia make up about 80% of the, of, of the foreign born. And again, what I can do is I can show you these cool interactive graphics. Um, but what you really see is that starting in 1970, you just have this large influx of immigrants uh, from Latin America, and we'll talk about Mexico in a second, but also from Asia. Um, we have a lot of immigrants from, from, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from, from India. Uh, we have some from China, from Japan. They're just all over the world. And <clears throat> what you see is that in 2010, the immigrants from Latin America now make up over half of our, of our, of our, of our foreign-born population, uh, with Asia in second place and Europe in this distant third. And when I was talking about Mexico, there's something that's really interesting that's happening there. So Mexico accounted for a large chunk of the increase in our foreign-born, but in the 2000s, in 2010, what we see is that actually the, 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 the immigrants from Mexico have actually been tailing off. And so, as uh, Ali mentioned, I oversee the U.S. Census Bureau, that's part of my job, um, and we talked to the Mexican Census Bureau. And what we saw after the Great Recession is that there was a flow back from the United States to Mexico. So we observed a decrease in the, in the United States, and the Mexicans observed an increase um, as well. And when we're talking about lessons learned about immigration, we have to think about why do people migrate from one country to another? And we think about immigration reform in the 21st century, we have to keep that in mind, and I'll keep uh, coming to that point again and again. Um, now, where have all the, the immigrants landed? And I, again, I'm going to show you some what I think are uh, pretty neat graphics. So if you go back to 1960, there's only two states that had over a million foreign born. That was uh, New York and California. And then we're just going to go ahead and do this kind of time-lapse photography again. And okay, who's, who's going to win? Who's going to win? Um, and again, what you'll notice is that the, in the Northeast and the Midwest, those bars on the bottom of the charts, you know, those are getting smaller and smaller, and the share that's in the, the, the West and the South uh, keep on increasing. And so again, the, the horse race continues. And again, you'll notice that the Northeast and Midwest keep on shrinking. And that what you have then is, you know, you have a state like California that really kind of takes, takes the cake, okay? So California has over 10 million uh, foreign born, but then you have states like Texas and Florida, and you have six states that actually have more than a million, million foreign born, so that's quite a big increase. Um, and then you have a lot of states also that have between a half million and a million. So immigration is something that is affecting large parts of the country. This is something that affects all communities. Perhaps that's why it's getting such, that, I mean, perhaps that's why comprehensive immigration reform is getting such a kind of broad base of support. Um, and I'm going to just show you a couple more pictures on this uh, before we get to the economic stuff. 
And what this chart so shows is for each state, kind of the share of the population that's foreign born, and this goes back to 1960. So the darker the color, the higher the share of the foreign born. And what you basically see is you know, New York is fairly dark, and then a bunch of other states that have you know, some, but most less than 10%. And then if you just kind of shoot through this over time, what you see is a large increase across many states, again, but especially in the South and the West. But what you do see is that immigration has affected all states in our country. It's gone up everywhere. Um, it's still, although we've had this move towards the, the, the South and the West, you still have pockets in the Northeast where, where it's just very, very high. Now, let's just look at Colorado for a second. So this is a, a map of your state by county, and it's the share of the, the foreign born. And we've highlighted Aspen, and this is going back to 1980, and it's like 5.4%. Then if we go to um, more recently, what we see is a lot more. And so you have, when we're thinking about immigration, you know, we looked at it at a state level, so then when you look within states, again, you see immigration is affecting a lot of our communities. And when I was talking to that young woman in Denver, if you look at Denver, is one of the highest concentrations. And in Aspen County, you've had this very large increase as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so now, let's put these changes into just as kind of some perspective. Because you hear a lot of arguments out there that frankly just don't make a lot of sense. So between 1970 and 2010, you had the foreign born population increase by 30 million. Okay, that's a lot. Often you hear about, hey, these people are taking our jobs. Well, what do they say? You know, what, 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 what do the data say? So if you look at the overall US economy, we had our population increase by 105 million during that time. So the, the natives increased by 75 million. Um, and employment increased by 60 million, okay? So we had this large influx of, of, immig of immigrants in the United States, and our jobs far outpaced that surge of immigration, okay? And historically, if you go back to the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1900s, that's always the case. We have these immigrants come in, they work, and we'll talk about that later. Um, they, they have very high labor force participation rates, um, and they really contribute to our economy. And our economy during this time, you know, did fairly well. So here's this arcane phrase, real disposable personal per, per capita income. Excuse me, I messed that up a little bit. What this basically means is if you look at per person in this country, you look at how much cash you have in your pocket after taxes, and you adjust that for inflation. So over this period where we had this huge influx of immigration, because you often hear about immigration might have this downward effect on wages, actually per person income more than doubled over this period. Okay, so again, I just think this is very kind of illustrative of the way immigration in the United States has worked over the past couple centuries. Um, if we look at productivity, that's how efficient we are at producing stuff. That also more than doubled during this period where we had this very large influx of immigration. So when you're thinking about the effects of immigration on the U.S. economy, just from a very, very high level, you know, what we see is consistent with history, which is that when we have big influxes of immigration, our economy grows, and our economy becomes more efficient too, okay? And that's an important lesson going forward. Now, just because we had this large influx of immigration and our economy did better, by no means implies that our immigration system is it need fixing? We all know that. And so now what I'd like to do is to kind of go through the, the main economic reasons why we want to do comprehensive immigration reform, why it's better for the economy just from a dollars and cents point of view. I think when we're thinking about how we lobby on this issue, it's important to have an arrow in our quiver, which is just the pure business case on how to do this. There's lots of other reasons too, um, but again, my, my advantage, uh, I think in this forum, is to talk about the, the economics of it. So, I'm gonna list about eight different reasons, and then I'm gonna go into those in a little bit more detail, okay? So the first one is that immigrants really help us in terms of the age distribution of our country, and we'll talk about that. We have an aging society, and these are some big issues we have to think about, okay? Um, we also have to think about the match between the immigrants that will be coming into our country and the skills that we need. So you heard Warren and Ali talk about this a little bit. There are certain sectors of our economy that are incredibly dependent on on, 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 on immigrant labor, on immigrant skills, and it kind of spans the spectrum of skills, and we'll talk about that. One 
thing that research has shown again and again is that the immigrant population in this country tends to be very entrepreneurial. And I'm gonna talk about the importance of entrepreneurship and the role of immigrants play in new business startups. Again, that's a very important part. The US has a very dynamic private sector. There's a, a good story to be told here. One of the things I alluded to earlier was that when we look at the immigrant population, they help fill certain needs, in particular in the high-tech sectors. And we'll go into that a little bit. And we, I was talking uh, last night about this and, and, and this morning as well with some folks here about when we're thinking about immigration, we just can't think about only the, the first generation of immigrants. We have to think about, well, what happens also to their offspring and their offspring's offspring, to the second and third generations as well. And in the United States, we do have this wonderful history of quick assimilation into the, into the US economy. And I'll show you just a couple of pictures about that. Um, finally, when we're talking about immigration reform for something that's very important for the Aspen community is the effect on tourism. So in these packages that are being discussed and what the president would like is better or lower restrictions on visas, on tourist visas to come to the United States. This is a huge industry uh, for the country. We run a huge trade surplus in travel and tourism. We have a great product to offer. Why not make that product easier to get for increasing middle class around the world? Um, and one thing that you often hear is this level playing field argument. So when I was talking to Warren last night, a lot of businesses face real challenges in terms of finding workers for their skill, and then sometimes they're competing against businesses who might do business underneath the table. And this is good for nobody, for lots of reasons. And so this is something that we want to talk about. And then finally, if we look at immigration reform, there's a lot of noise out there on the subject. It's just true, though. If we do conference of immigration reform, this will help our budget. And I'll try to explain to you why that just makes common sense. So if you look at the first seven reasons I listed, those are all reasons why immigration reform will, will help the economy. Usually when you help the economy, if you help boost GDP growth, that tends to help the budget. So you know, that's, not, that's not that much of a stretch. Okay, so let's talk about um, kind of the first part, about the, about the aging of the distribution. Now, like a lot of European countries and Japan, we have an aging distribution. And what's going to happen, and this chart doesn't show it that well, so you'll, uh, so I'll, let me just tell a couple of takeaways from, from, from this. Um, what's going to happen between now and 2060 is our population is gradually going to get older. The fraction of people who are over 65 is going to increase, okay? And again, if you look at Japan, they've already, they've already gone through this quite a bit. So if you look at the number of people who are gonna be more than 65, that's gonna more than double during this time period. It's gonna go from about 43 million today, and it's gonna to go to over 90 million by 2060, okay? Also what's gonna happen is the fraction of our population that's over 85, that's gonna triple during this time period, okay? So what our country will then need is we'll need a workforce to help support our aging population. And so that's, something that we'll have to do. And when we look at the, you know, the, the, the foreign born historically, what we see is that the foreign born when they come to this country tend to be in the working age distribution. Okay? They tend to have a higher percentage of folks who are kind of in their prime working years. And I'll show this in two graphs. There's this one, and then let me show you this one as well. So what this one shows is the, the, the blue bars on the left is kind of the distribution of the, of the, the, the foreign born. The bars on the right are the, the uh, <coughs> are for, for for the native born, and what you'll notice is that the blue bars have this big bump in the distribution in like in the the late 20s, 30s, and 40s, kind of the prime working years, and that really kind of helps out our overall age distribution uh, for 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 working. And again, if we're thinking about our aging distribution and our ability to support that aging distribution, we're going to need this going forward. Okay. So I mentioned before about entrepreneurship and, and immigrants starting um, new businesses. And there's just a bunch of data that shows this. And I'm not gonna weigh you down in a bunch of numbers. I have a couple bullet points here, I believe. But let me just talk about entrepreneurship and the importance in the US economy. 
So the US economy has businesses that start every year and fail every year. We're a very dynamic economy. So when we're looking at entrepreneurship and new businesses, this is hugely important. New businesses before the Great Recession, they're usually about a half a million of them a year, and they employ about three million people, okay? So that's kind of like three million new jobs a year entering the US economy. So if we look at kind of overall job creation of the US economy over time, new businesses play a huge role in this. And over time, what we've seen in the United States is that the rate of entrepreneurship has actually been kind of decreasing. It's been decreasing for a couple decades. But what we notice, though, is the foreign born tend to be kind of real business starters. Now, we're not just talking about kind of small businesses. They tend to start also really big businesses. You can think of Google. So one of the Google founders was a, was a, was a foreign immigrant. Um, you can think about Yahoo as well. And there's any number of companies. In fact, if you look about 25% of the companies that launched IPOs over the past decade, they were started by the foreign born. So, when we're thinking about the US economy and being competitive, we need to do more to entice these entrepreneurs to come here to the United States. And we should make it easy for them. If you have an idea to start a business and you have US people who are willing to back you financially to start a business, shouldn't we make that easier for it to do that? And that's important for two reasons. Every other, a lot of other countries in the world are figuring this out. Okay, so to attract these entrepreneurs to our country, we're increasingly competing against other countries. Okay, so we're kind of behind the curve here. So this is what we want to do. Another reason we want to make it easier is that when you look around the world today, you see a lot of countries, this is actually a good news story, you see a lot of countries that are improving. They're becoming more developed, their standards of living are increasing. So what does that have to do with anything? So when you look historically at reasons why people emigrate, one of the reasons is they're, they're looking to go someplace better. So as the standard of living is increasing, say in China or in India or in Mexico, the decision to come to the United States to start a, a new business diminishes a little bit. So we have to make it easier for them to come here, okay? So currently, if you want to come here and start a new business, it's kind of hard. So this is something that we really want to do. And again, entrepreneurship is just such a, you know, it's such a fundamental American thing. Um, and fundamentally, you know, it just helps our economy so much. And if you look at like the Fortune 500 companies, this is a famous statistic that people point out, about 41% were started by immigrants, okay? So again, this just kind of amplifies why we want to do this so much. Now, let's talk about um, occupations. And we could spend hours talking about this because uh, there's so many different industries that are involved. So what this chart shows is the share of various jobs that are held by the native born versus immigrants. Okay, and they're kind of rank ordered. So the jobs at the top are those jobs that have the most, the most immigrants, proportionally speaking, and that goes down. And that dashed line is the average. The average is 16% 16, 16% of our workforce are, are foreign born. And what you see when you're looking at those jobs where immigrants have a disproportionate role in jobs is you have a lot of very kind of high tech jobs and then you have a lot of other jobs as well. So when we look at STEM workers, now STEM is an acronym, means science, technology, engineering, and math. That's something we place a lot of emphasis on. You'll see that for those folks who have more than a bachelor's degree, you have a master's degree in computer science or something like that, you know, 44% are, are, are foreign born. Um, and then, before going into talking about the tech stuff, let's talk about these other jobs. So, you heard the previous speakers talk about the importance of the foreign born for agriculture, um, and also for the industry here in, in Aspen, for, for the resort industry. Um, if you think about construction as well. So it's kind of like all over the map where the, where the foreign born are providing us the skills we need to compete. And what all these academic studies show is that when we bring in these people with the right skills, our economy does better. Everybody does better. It's a tide that lifts all boats. Okay, so which kind of goes against some of the narratives that you, you sometimes hear. So this is a really important story um, that, that's, that's, that's going on. And currently, we have a hard time, this is where the system is broken, businesses have a hard time getting the right skills. We need to change our programs so we can better align the skills that we need uh, with the people who, who we're letting in. So that's just, a, there's a big mismatch there. 
um, you know, kind of especially in agriculture. So when you look at the Senate package that you're going to hear later today, you know, they make a step in that direction. This is something the president has tried to emphasize. And now let me talk about the, the, the high-tech high folks for a second. Um, when it comes to high-tech and the foreign-born, there's just lots of facts that you're going to hear out there. If you look at foreign-born science and engineers, they tend to have a very high patent rate. And then what, also been, what has also been found is that when you look at the foreign-born engineers, when they patent, their businesses do better, and then everyone who works in those businesses do better. So it really is a tide that lifts all boats type of story. And so you also notice that when you have the foreign-born patenting, their native-born counterparts also patent more. There's this kind of spillover effect, which makes a lot of sense, right? If you're working with somebody who's really good, you're going to become better yourself. So that's just a, a, very, that's just a very natural story. And if you look at the share of patents um, that have been granted in the United States that go to the foreign-born, that's a number that's been increasing. And again, it's disproportionate. So in these high-tech fields, the foreign-born are really important. Now, as an administration, we've been pushing STEM education very hard domestically. And hopefully that will bear fruit. We'll have more STEM graduates in the future. But in the interim, we really do need this, th these high-tech workers. Because we live in a very globally competitive economy today, much more so than a couple decades ago. Where we're going to excel are in areas where we have a big advantage. Historically, where we've had a big advantage is in the areas where like, we're really smart, where we can really innovate. Um, now, we can be really smart and we can really innovate in all sorts of different areas. Now, in agriculture, you can be incredibly high-tech. And that's something that the United States is very good at. So if we want to compete against the world, if we want to compete against countries who are taking these issues very seriously, we have to make the right investments, and we also have to let the right people in so our businesses can excel. Um, now, one of the points that I made earlier was that this fact about assimilation. And when we look at this chart, what it basically shows is kind of income by if you're first generation, second generation, third generation, um, or, or, or more. And basically what you see is that kind of by that second generation, by the offspring of the foreign born, economically speaking, they look a lot like everybody else. Okay, it only takes kind of one generation for kind of incomes to kind of equal out. Okay, which is I think is a pretty amazing fact. If you go back in history, this is often true. So if you go back in history and you look at especially the offspring of the foreign born, you know, the, the fraction that speak English is incredibly high. And then they look very similar in terms of education. Um, they look very similar in terms of income. And they also look very similar in terms of occupation. Now this chart's kind of hard to see, but it basically makes the point that after the first generation, if we're looking at the kids of the first generation, they kind of look like everybody else in terms of their occupational distribution. Okay, and so when we're thinking about immigration, when you hear about you know, the pluses and minuses, we always have to think about not just of the, the folks coming in, but we also have to think about their offspring, okay? Because most people in this room are offspring of immigrants, you know, a couple generations back at least. So when we're looking at this, when we're thinking about the benefits of immigration, it's not just of the folks coming in currently, but we have to look at this in the long run. And as I said earlier, if you go back to the stuff I was saying about from 1970 to 2010, you know, the U.S. economy has done a lot better, um, in part because we've had this, this, this kind of great assimilation. Um, <clears throat> finally, I mentioned about travel and tourism. That's really important for, for this area. It's really important for, for the U.S. economy. There's about 8 million people in the U.S. economy who are tied to the travel and tourism industry. Uh, we had 66.6 .6 million foreign visitors last year, and we run a big trade surplus. More people come here and spend money than Americans go abroad and spend money, okay? So that trade surplus that we run in that area, it's about $50 billion, okay? So in terms of service sectors, this is an area that we do quite well. But what we also know is that there's a bunch of countries, by law, where it's kind of hard to get a visa to come visit the United States and it's very asymmetric. And so this is something that we have to fix. And that's something that I could see that would, I, that would benefit this community uh, uh, specifically. So um, that's something that the President's pushing. And then let me just go ahead and, since I'm running out of time, I've gone through most of these reasons um, that we listed at the very beginning. Um, and let me talk about this last one, about improving our budget. 
you see a lot of bad numbers out on this subject. And it's really unfortunate. Um, I'm an economist, so I get made fun of. And I'm not invited to many parties, but that's, that's cool. But um, what is really unfortunate is that you have lots of people just lobbying numbers right and left. And I can do that too. That's just gonna like, confuse everybody. But just think about it. If you go through all the arguments I just laid out about how fixing our immigration system would boost our economy, how can you come to a conclusion other than this is gonna help our budget situation? You can't, you have to do some, well, I have to be careful with my language. You have to do some bad stuff to get that conclusion. Unfortunately, there are people out there who come up with bad stuff. And some of that bad stuff came out last week, which was quickly discredited. But it just makes sense. If you get people out from the underground economy who then actually start paying Social Security taxes, you know, you're not paying them cash on the table, that increases our tax base. So Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, sent a letter to the IRS commissioner um, not the IRS commissioner, so security commissioner, asking what effects would comprehensive immigration reform have on the social security budget. And the numbers are hugely positive. It just makes sense. So when you hear this talk about this comprehensive immigration reform will cost the US economy, that just doesn't make sense. And I'm saying that as like a, an economist who spent most of his career in research, um, you know, not, not as a political guy. So um, this is something that, this is an argument that we should be winning. Okay, if we get people off the underground economy, which has all sorts of negative consequences, quick, all sorts of negative consequences anyway, into the, to the formal economy, that's gonna boost tax revenue. If we do all these other changes that we were talking about, if we get more entrepreneurship, if we get more innovation, that's gonna grow the economy. When you grow the economy, that means the revenues coming to the government increase, the spending going out decreases. That's just the way the world works. And so that's why if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, that's, that's one, that's how you're gonna get this effect. So that's the bottom line there. Um, and let me just say that, you know, the President feels very strongly about this issue and we really do think the time is right. And again, when we have groups like you who are gathered here today, you know, to talk about this and to communicate with your, with your representatives at the local level, at the state level, you know, the House of Representatives levels, your senators, your, your governors, that's what really moves the needle. That's why we're at the stage where we may actually get something to happen. Ali mentioned you know, the timetable for the summer, and because this process is ongoing, lots of amendments are being considered, this is not the time to take the foot off the gas pedal. If anything, this is the time to accelerate a little bit more. So. Um, with that, I just want to say, you know, kind of thank you again. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, the panels that are coming up next. Uh, I'll be here. If you have questions, please come up to me. If you want to share with me your, your points of view, I'd really like that too. I'll be here till noon. And um, so, again, thank you very much.